Okay, so <clears throat> let's try to evolve our exercise by inserting some state that can be modified uh, by the application itself. Uh, the idea is uh, try to, to, de to decide okay, which state variables we need, where to put them, and how to update them. First of all, which uh, state variable do we need? What are our options? What are the suggestions? For example, right now, <clears throat> all our inf all the information about uh, our web page is just in this variable. This is a global variable inside this module. You see, it's outside of the function. So it's not something that is part uh, of the React uh, no, ecosystem. Uh, and this one object, which is a, sorry, a sort of a complex object that contains some, inform some properties, and then an array of other objects that contain other properties, and so on. So one option could be, could be to turn this object into our state. So we could decide that we have uh, uh, the question, object, set question, as a, a state initialized with the phase question. So phase question is a, is a global constant that we already computed. And it's not, no, it's not a constant, sorry, it's a global object. And we can <coughs> store a reference to this object as our initial state. OK? This wouldn't be wrong by itself. What it means is that uh, um, instead of fake question, we could just put the state, uh, the question by uh, state. Again, question the text, question the email. So what we are doing is uh, we create a state object, we initialize it with the global constant, and then use it instead of the other one. And this should work, I hope, in the same way. OK? Uh, and by the way, in the component inspector, you have, uh, uh, so let's make it a bit larger to be able to read it. No, it doesn't work. It doesn't uh, zoom here. Yeah, it does. Let me find a good compromise. OK. So if I select the component here in the, in the React Inspector, <clears throat> by selecting a component, it will, all, it will tell me all the props that this component receives and all the state variables that are currently defined. And by the way, these are updated in real time. If I click on the likes, which is still working, you see that the state is updated. So it's good for debugging. We can see. We don't see the, lo the local variables because the function execution goes to the end and local variables disappear. But the state uh, is stored here. And uh, you see that the, in this case, we have a state that is called question and contains our object, OK? And you see that uh, they are called state one and state two. Because what counts uh, for use states is the order in which the states are defined. We may ask the, the debugger to try to find the names, question and lives of these variables. But these are not stored anyway, you know, any, any, anywhere. They're just uh, you know, 
conventionally the name of the variable that all the value. The value itself doesn't, don't have any name. Hmm? That's why the order is important for the use case. Okay, so we can see it the, uh, there. Hmm? Okay. That's my key, okay. And uh, this is a possibility, you see it works. The, you can store a complex object into the state. The problem is uh, the evolution of this state. If we want to increase uh, a variable, for example, the vote up, okay, I want to vote up. So the state, uh, I define it as in, in, hap, in up. Why did I think to define the state in up? First of all, because I already have this fake question constant. It, it was there. And second, because I need to pass uh, parts of the state uh, to question component, you see, and parts of this uh, to the answers component. So it needs to be in a component that is uh, father to both of them. So we cannot put the state into answers or into the question component. We, it needs to be in an upper component. Okay, app is okay for us in this case. <coughs> then imagine we want to implement the vote up. So it means that we can create a callback, vote up, which is a function that takes uh, what? An answer ID? Maybe. And does something to return, to change the state by updating the answer ID. Okay? So, this could be a set question with a totally new object, identical to the one to the previous one, except for the score of this specific answer. This is what we should do. Okay, maybe we don't do it like this, we should do as a, as a callback because the new value depends on the old value, like we said. So, okay, it's not a constant that we compute here, it's a callback that will compute this. Uh, yeah, that's some, okay, of course it's a, uh, it's not JavaScript, okay? Old question. It will return old question. It will return a totally new object identical to the previous one that was old question, except for the score, the specific answer. Why? Because what we said is that the new, when we change the state, we should never modify the properties of the previous state, but you should always, we should always create a new object with the updated value. So we only need to change one number, but we must change everything. Recreate the question, recreate the answers, recreate the scores, and then change that one. It can be done, okay? But at that point, the question object will be changed. So it will be complex, okay? It needs a lot of work. We take the question, we break it down into the properties and then recreate a new one. Okay, we can do that. It's maybe five lines of code or six. But then, and then we have a new question every time. So every time I update this number here, I would change all the question database, say. And this means that, for example, also the question component would need to change. 
because it receives a different uh, set of properties. These props are changed because the question object changed. Okay, maybe not the idea because it's a number, but these are strings, so we need to rebuild them. These are objects. So we are, you know, re-rendering some component that has nothing to do with the value we changed. Because the unit of refreshing the component is the single state variable, the single prop. So what, do, what does this suggest to us? It suggests to us that we, it's more convenient to break down the, com the state into smaller substates that can evolve independently from each other. Instead of having one big state with one big object with many data structures inside, let's break it down in several states so that every portion of the state can evolve independently and the changes to that portion will only cause the rendering of those components that are affected by that, by that information and not by something else which is unrelated. So in one way we must undo our effort to create one big uh, database and have uh, little pieces of information, as little as, as little as possible I would say, and as independent as possible. Hmm? So for example, I would have uh, two, at least two, two different states. One with the, the question itself, only the fields, the property related to the question, and another with a list of answers. only with the answer. So if I modify something with the answers, I delete an answer, I edit an answer, I vote an answer, I only need to modify the answer state instead of the question state. Okay? So, okay, it's not a problem. We need to just uh, decide what is in our question state and what is in our maybe answers state. Okay, we set an initial value and then we can evolve from that. Uh, maybe always stated from this fake question, okay? In the future we will know that, uh, we will learn that this fake question okay, will not be a constant, we need to load it from the back end to the API. It will be an API that gives us this information. And also thinking about the API will also help us to align the state of the components with the information that the API provides. We already have an API get questions and get question ID, which is separate from get answers, remember, when we did the API design. So it also makes sense that these information that are um, provided in different ways at different times from the server could be stored into different variables. It's, it's not a requirement, but uh, usually when we do the design, we tend to align the front-end state and the API and the back-end database roughly, not identically, but roughly. But anyway, now we, already have, we, all, we, all, we have all the data here, and so what can we do here? We could create uh, an object uh, that is initialized uh, with the value of the question. So fake question uh, dot uh, ID, and maybe we call it ID. Uh, let me mimic uh, this object. ID, text, email, date, except the answers that we don't, we don't need those. Okay, so we can, sorry. What is that? We have the ID from fake question to the ID. We can have uh, the uh, text fake question dot text 
then I can have, uh, sorry, let's maybe go into multiple lines. Uh, it's easier. Then we have a date. I question the date. What do we have more? Text, email. The ID, text, email, date. Email. Morning. So this could be a, a way <coughs> of, of uh, creating an object that represents only the properties of the question. I didn't want to build a constructor function only for that. I just created a, a, a raw object here. I didn't want the answers property, <coughs> and I don't want the methods of the object. And then maybe the answer is, is the, we create an array starting from the list of answers. So maybe it's, uh, oh, it can be, can it be the, or actually, actually this attribute? So let's see how the answer object is made. ID, text, email, score, date. Yeah, could, it could work. So the, we can initialize the answer state with the fake question dot uh, what is called the answers. We have get answers that already provides me with a copy, with a new array with a copy of the elements. Get answers. So these are only the initial values. Now I separated the question from the list of answers. This returns an array, a fresh array with new values. Okay? <coughs> now, um, let's comment this one for the moment. We need to come to it in a moment. But uh, let's settle the, the properties. Uh, the answers now is, will be just the answers state. And in the question component, uh, okay, I have these three fields, they're okay. So instead of extracting the answers directly from the big object, we have a, a state that only contains the, the array. So let's see if it works. It should, let's go to app. And we see that now we have, uh, okay, <laughs> the links, the likes is always there, but we have one state for the question, ID, text, email, and date, and one state with the list of, of four answers. It's an array of four answer objects. Answer one, answer two, and so on. And these are a bit uh, long because they contain a DJS object, but. Okay? And everything is working okay. Uh, all the other components didn't notice anything because they still receive the same properties, the same values as properties, as their props. Okay? So a self-contained component only cares about the value it gets with this property. Nothing more. Okay, now <clears throat> we want to implement, uh, so we implemented the state. We decompose the state into simpler objects. One row object, which is the question, and one list of answers, one array of answers, which is the other. Next step, uh, we try to think about the edit button, or the delete button, by the way. So, uh, maybe let's start with the delete, it's easier. It's not uh, what the exercise requires, but let's start with the delete. Deleting a question, an answer, means, uh, or requires us to define a delete uh, callback. Right? right. Uh, that starts from some information and updates the state. 
We never think of uh, deleting something from the table. The table is created from the props. Uh, the props are taken from the state. So my goal is to update the state. And then the page will refresh by itself. So for deleting an answer, I just need to define a function that takes the answer ID. And then changes the states of the answers. By creating a new array, which is identical to the previous one, except that it has one row missing. And uh, who's our friend for doing this? Filter. We can just apply a filter that creates a new array of elements that match some conditions, right? This filter should take the old state and translate it to a new state. So it needs to be in a callback because the new state depends on the old one. So we call the set answers with a callback function that takes the old answers and replaces them with old answers dot filter. And what do we want to filter? We want to keep all the elements whose ID is not the one to be deleted. So the given answer has the ID, adult ID, which is different from the ID that we received as a parameter. OK? So look at the nesting. Delete answer is a callback. This callback has one instruction, set answer. Set answer contains one callback because we are setting a state, a future state depending on the current value, so we need uh, to use a callback function instead of a constant uh, to avoid the race conditions. And this callback is a filter that, of course, requires its own filtering callback. OK? So this maybe works. Um, let's see if it works. For seeing if it works, we must associate the, the calling this function to the delete button, which is inside the answer component. So where, where is the button? The button is inside answers, inside answer table, and inside here, answer row, answer actions, here. We must associate an action to this button. So on click should be a call to some function that we defined in app. OK, that's, that will be boring. Props. Uh, Dot, uh, what is the name of the app or the function was delete answer. Delete answer is not complete. Let's keep it like that for a moment. So it means that answer action should receive a prop. From whom? From its father. Answer action is a child of uh, answer row. So answer row should have a prop, should pass down a prop of delete answer from props dot delete answer. And itself, answer row is a child of answer table, right? And so we must add to answer row The 
property delete answer coming from its father and the father of uh, answer table is answers and so where we instantiate answer table we must provide also this property and answers is finally called by app where we can finally provide a reference to this function. Yes, it's boring. If we need to call a callback from an asset component, we must drill all the intermediate components and be sure that we send in the callback function itself. First step. So define the callback and uh, uh, propagating the reference to this callback to the component that needs to call it. And the more level we have, the more passages we need to do. Okay. Second step, uh, this function as a parameter ID. And in this uh, button we only have what is that on click delete answer we are not passing any parameter here the on click should refer to a function and this function is called basically it's called with the event uh, as a parameter and we don't want the event as a parameter we don't care we want the question id so we need here to define a function that will call this prop with the given parameter. So again, this would be a callback. I, I cannot write, what I want to do is this one. Um, props dot ID. The ID of the question I am on. I want to delete row number one or two or three. Two problems. One, I don't have ID in answer rations. So I need to pull it down from, again, ID is, uh, uh, sorry, props. Answer ration is uh, here from answer row. ID is taken from props dot answer dot id I stop here because answer row already has uh, so let's split it like that it's more readable Oops. okay we have these components <coughs> answer row knows about uh, the answer and so it can extract the ID from the answer and pass it down to answer actions. So that now answer action can use the ID. But this would be wrong, like here, because this would call this function now and set the on click callback as the return value of this function. This is not what we want to, what they want to do. We are calling a function here. We don't want to call a function. We want to store a functional reference to be called later on. So this means that simply it should be in a callback. So the on click event will be a callback and this callback will call this function. With a number as a parameter. So every time we have a callback with a parameter, with an argument, uh, instead of just writing the function name, we must embed it in a callback, where the parameter is, can be given by closure, okay? by closing over some properties. So in theory, it might work. In theory. It doesn't, of course. Delete answer is not a function in uh, uh, on click prop dot delete answer prop dot delete answer in answer action delete answer so answer actions is called 
probability answer, delete answer equal. So in answer row, ah, okay, I didn't save up. It works. Okay? So let's try again just to be satisfied with ourselves. I want to delete the first question. I click on delete and it goes away. The last one, also. And we see that the state in app is updated. Now we only have two answers left. Okay, if we, oh, if we load, of course, we are reloading from the fake data and everything is reset from the beginning. So it's only changing the state until the application is reloaded, <coughs> until the page is reloaded. Okay, so that was easy. Well, boring but easy. Because it was, the action itself was just deleting one item from an array. So we just rebuild an array with identical values except the missing row. Filter is doing for us. What app is a bit more complex, slightly more complex, right? Because we need to recreate an array with the same elements, except some of them are modified. One of them is modified, okay? So let's start again. Now we know the drill. We start from what we want to do for the data manipulation, from the state update. And then we just play with the properties to reach the component where the function needs to be called with all the parameters that it needs. So the other one is uh, now const what app. Again, we can take a uh, an answer ID. And uh, the goal of this is to set the answers by taking the old answers and rebuilding a new one with the same number of elements and with some of them replaced. This is a job for map, I would say. Same number of elements by transforming the elements themselves. So it will be all the answers dot map and mapping some answer to something else. What is this something else? Well, there are two cases. The first case, the ID doesn't match. It's not the one that is trying to vote. So let it pass through. Second case, the ID does match. And so I need to recreate another object which is identical to the current one, except for the ID. Sorry, except for the vote. The score. So, is uh, we can write it the old way. If a dot id equal to id, then we return some new object with updated score. As we just return A, the answer itself. Okay, the map is taking one answer at a time. If the answer to the ID is not the ID that we want, we just return it. So we are rebuilding the same elements in the array. Otherwise, we must return a new object with a data score, so I can do that in many ways. One way could be just to create a new object by copying A and changing the score to A score plus one. 
I hope it works. In my mind, it works. Then let's say if the code agrees with me. So I create a new object. I don't change the value of a dot score. I can change the value of one property of a parameter that I get. Okay, I need to create a new object. This array contains new objects, oh, copies of the same object that didn't change, or something. If I change something, it must be new. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's try it. Well, there's something. Some parentheses is wrong. So the map it closes here. This a tensor closed there. Okay. okay. Why does semicolon expected? Sorry. Well, that's the map. Yeah, me to uh, dot map. No, because it's ju I'm just returning a value. Sorry. Map. All dancers dot map. Thirty-seven. Okay. Oh. Okay. Thank you. I would never show it. Okay. Okay. So this is the function that may work or not. And let's try to call it to see if it works. By playing the same game, what app needs to be drilled down? Now we know the, the game. Into answers, what app equal to what app? Then we go inside answers and need to pass it to the table. What app equal to props dot what app? And then from answer table to answer row and finally from answer row to answer actions uh, what we do sometimes is to create an object uh, with all these callbacks inside okay instead of passing them one by one we call it actions and then we pass it down they are just read only you know, reference to functions. If you have too many of them, instead of passing them one by one, you can just put them into an object. They will never change, so they will never trigger a reload. But for the moment, insurrections, and finally, in insurrections, <coughs> I can, into this button, on click, equal to Callback, now I put the, ro the right arrow, props dot uh, what app, props dot id. Let's try it. Yeah, seems to work. I can delete one, increase the other one, and so on. The difficulty is always uh, writing the code so that a new state is created with the minimal changes without mutating any of the objects. I'm not mutating, when I'm deleting an array, I'm not mutating the array, I'm creating a new one. When I'm changing some object property, I'm not mutating the object itself, I'm creating a new one, always. Always new objects. So that React can check them and say, okay, this is changes and this not. And it doesn't need to compare the values themselves, only the object references. It will not go into comparing the values. That would be inefficient. 
to say that something changed, we just provide a new array or an array with a new element, a different element, and so on. And then it will change. Um, yeah. Finally, what I wrote here is uh, correct. In many times we don't write in this way, but we use a more compact syntax. Uh, normally I would write it like what up. Of course, is an ID, our arrow function. Then set answers. The logic is the same, okay? With A to A, uh, sorry, the answers with all the answers, all the answers to map. And in many cases, uh, just to make it more compact, we tend to use a ternary operator question mark semicolon, uh, okay? So we say, okay, in the map, we map A into, so a single answer into A dot ID equal to ID. If yes, then this object. Otherwise, A. So instead of writing you know, the, the function body with return statement and if statement, uh, we try to write it as an, as an expression. And this is the expression using the ternary operator. Or sometimes also the logical shortcuts and and or. So it's, it's not readable, okay? If you, if, you find, if you find something like that, it will take you 10 minutes just to, to decode what it means and how, how is the operator priority. But you will see a lot of code like this, just for, uh, for avoiding. This is on syntax. Open a function, make an if, make a return. This is the syntax much uh, linear. Yes, yes. Thank you. No. Hmm. No, it doesn't trust you. <laughs> Okay, so uh, just check if this is also working, if I didn't do any mistake. I missed an N here, for example. And uh, yeah, it's still working. Okay. So this is basically the way we, we manage uh, states uh, and callbacks and events uh, in React. We see that compared to the DOM manipulation that we did a couple of weeks ago, here the, the, real, the focus is split. We have one focus on rendering. And if you see, today we didn't do any rendering. We didn't modify any return statement of any component. It was already there. And the other half is managing the state. Events and state. And from the state, then the rendering will go by itself. Hmm? And so the approach we took uh, of uh, first create a static version of a website and then make it dynamic is possible just because the, the rendering code is the same and many components don't have a state. And so they really don't care whether the data they receive, the props they receive are static or are dynamic or are modified in some way. They don't care. They only care about the current value of the props. And if the prop changes, React re-renders. That's it. That's why we are not uh, container these are philosophy questions if you want. Uh, 
container is a function. So the result of the rendering of this component here up is the result of the function container. So why don't we call the function container ourselves? Yeah. We could call this function container with some children and call the children themselves and so on. And at the end, we all have all the, the tree. And this is what React does. But the difference is that if we call them, we tend to call everything every time. A function that calls another function that calls another function. Here, we are just saying the structure of the function that should be called. And then React only selectively calls those one whose parameters has changed. So that's why we, we, have, we separate the phase of, uh, of uh, state update from the phase of rendering. Because rendering happens selectively. At the first render, everything is called. And but the, on the next ones, only those components that uh, really have some, their parameters change. And that's why it's important that every component only relies on props and state. Because then it gives a very precise information to react about whether this component needs to be uh, re-rendered or not. Or not. Okay, so right now we only did something simple, relatively simple, buttons. Actions that only require one click. Well, there are two other actions in a form like, in a module like this, edit or insert. And that are more complex. Those are more complex because they need a user to provide also some data, some information. In a word, forms. How can we extend what we did here to a user interface that also contains forms, inputs, buttons, and so on? And uh, what we discover here is that, uh, and will be the subject on next week's uh, exercise, um, is that if you look at the form elements in HTML, they are a mess. Hmm? They were developed in different times, uh, so the select, uh, so the drop down, behaves in a way that is different from input, and behaves in a way that is different from radio buttons, uh, and, uh, and check boxes are still different because they have different attributes. Okay? It's complex. Okay? Um, Text area is different, so a block of lines is different from input uh, because they have different attributes. The text in a text area is inside the, the children, and uh, the text in a, is an input is inside the value attribute. So, so what uh, React does is to give us a uniform way of uh, representing form elements. So in JSX, all the elements have a value attribute, all the form elements, okay? So whether it's an input or a select or a text area, they have an attribute which is called value. It's not exactly the same attribute at the DOM level, okay? Because in the DOM is more complex, but this complexity is hidden by, by React. And uh, we have an attribute called value, which is always updated uh, to the current value of the field of an input field. And also a default value, which was the initial value of the, of the field, okay? Then the default value is when you find an input with already some information, and then you can change it. So the default value is the initial one, and the value is what you typed in real time. And, and this is also applies to the text areas and to select and to draw line menus that in normal HTML can, cannot be done, okay? But it's a, so uniformly, all form elements support the value attribute, and they all support also the onChange event. OnChange is not like onClick. OnChange is an event that is triggered whenever something is changed on that input element. So I'm typing something in, a, in, a, in the input. I'm uh, uh, changing 
the, the menu item, the selected item in a select, I'm switching, I'm toggling a radio um, uh, yes, a button, a, check, a checkbox, uh, or changing a radio button, and so on. In, a, in plain HTML, at the DOM level, they trigger different kinds of events. In React, uh, they are you know, summarized. Uh, there's what is one synthetic event, high-level event, uh, that is called on-chain. So it's easier. We don't need to, to bother too much about the details of, of every element. So it's more consistent. Um, OK, let's. Uh, of course, uh, like we have in HTML, uh, at the DOM level, whenever we call an event handler, we have the event object as a parameter, as an argument. Many times, we don't need to use, actually, the event object uh, because we already know what to do. For example, in, in the example like deleting a row, we have explicit information about the row ID, the answer ID. We didn't need to go back in the DOM and query the, you know, remember what we did with the DOM uh, some weeks ago. Go to the, to, the children, or to, the, to the sibling element to extract some information. No, because the information is already there. We know it from top down, from the top down information flow. So this is less important in React than it is in normal um, DOM. Uh, OK, this is just some, some other events that are uh, defined that some other properties in these events. Uh, this is just a list. Uh, but uh, some warnings about uh, defining event tenders. We did, we did the on click, okay? This, this is valid for the on click and it's valid for any other, um, for the other event handler. So let's imagine you are defining a, an event handler like a function like we did before in the app, for example. Then we was passed down as a property, but it doesn't change the issue. And so the onClick handler could be the name of the function, OK, as a value, as an object value. Remember in JSX, uh, the braces in a property means uh, I'm passing the JavaScript expression. In HTML, you would have given the name of the function as a String. This is not valid in JSX. That would be just a string that is not a callable object. So you need to provide a, the, an object and not the string with the name. OK, so this is different from HTML. And also, this is wrong because, of course, it will call the handler when we create the page, when we, create the, when we render the page instead of when, we, when the user actually clicks on the button. So this is what we did. No, it was not a problem. And uh, we already knew, we also knew that if we need to pass some parameters to the handler, we must wrap it into another callback layer. Okay, so this is what we discovered in our on click. So basically, either the name of a function in braces or a callback that calls the function itself. Um, okay, but going down to forms. Uh, this question is strange. Who owns the state? We just saw that the state uh, in React is a concept which is uh, a container private to a component. Good. But then I have an input element. An input element is an, an HTML component, it's a DOM component that contains its own state. OK. He likes it better than better you. <laughs> uh, it contains its own state, because it knows what I, you are typing at the moment. So we might have a conflict. Uh, the state is inside, you know, when an input component, they type something, the component itself, at the DOM level, in the browser, knows what I typed. So it's a state which is already embedded into the low-level input element, the DOM input element. And this is a problem in React. Because it's an information that I have down there inside the component, and you, we know that moving information from the bottom to the top is impossible. 
and the React component that maybe includes the button, includes the field, also wants to know what I type on the field. Uh, what I mean is that uh, there are two ways of using forms in React, two styles of programming. One is uh, the so-called control components. It means that uh, I have uh, an input element which is inside uh, a React component, and this input element will be forced always to copy the state uh, of a state variable in the React component. And we see how. So the, we have a React component that have a state variable, and this state variable binds the input element. Every time it changes state variable, the input element changes. And every time the user modifies the input element, the state variable must change also. In this way, the truth is inside the React state element at any time. The input element becomes only a display, basically, for this value, a window of this value. Then we can be synchronized. The other way <coughs> is uh, uncontrolled form components, where we just use the input tag, and we, and React, the React component doesn't know about the state until we submit the form, for example, we click on some event. At that point, the, the value is collected, like, it, like we would do in normal HTML. So the value is owned by the input element, by the form element, and is only transferred to React when some event occurs. Okay, we see more the first form because we have more control over what happens, and so everything will be done in React. In the second case, we will do something in JavaScript outside the React and something in React. So sometimes it can be more efficient, but it's more complex to, to program. So what does it mean in practice? It means that we have a, okay, a form element. Imagine an input. But uh, since the interface is uniform, it could also be a selected, could be a text area, could be a, a radio button, and whatever. What do you want? An input element. Um, a control element, control form elements, has two rules. Value and on change are always set on this element. Value equal to x is an attribute of input. Value equal to x. Where x is a state variable in the React component that renders this input. So I have a component with a state variable x. I render, in my return statement, an input field with value equal to x. This means that the value of this component can never change. It's always identical to x. So if x means uh, 1, 2, 3, and the input field will be 1, 2, 3. If I try to type into it, I will not succeed because the value is forced to be equal to x. It's a prop. So I need to change the value of x whenever the user wants to change the value of the field. And that's why I need to define a non-change event on the input element that causes a callback that updates x with the new value of the HTML input element. Because every time the input is rendered, the new value is forced on it. And this new value is taken from the state x. If I want the form to display something different, I must change x. And I must change x in reaction to a change event when the user tries to change something, and the target value contains this new value. You see, this is a, a value which comes from outside React. It comes from the browser, from the target event. And this event is not managed by the browser itself, because the change does not change the input element itself. 
but it comes uh, from the state chain. If you set value and unchange both of them to a for component, you are creating a control component where the, where the information about the value, both the value set by the program, set by React, and the value set by the user are always inside the state variable. If you forget on change, you are creating a uh, uh, form which is impossible to change. Always contain the value of x and cannot be changed because there's not, nobody who is going to change this state variable. Okay? Uh, so it's something like this. You have an input to any component, okay? When in the rendering, you have an input element, type equal to text, whatever, value equal to a state variable, on change equal to an event tender. And this event tender is basically updating set name, the state. Submit is for the submission of the form, we don't care today. Okay, so we are creating an input element with, which is totally controlled by the state. Um, on the other hand, the uncontrolled components are components where the React component, the React component that, that includes them, doesn't have any state. So the input works by itself. The on-change is managed by the browser itself. I type something and the browser just updates whatever is in the input element. There's no control from React to the input box. And uh, so we must, uh, normally we set a default value if we want. <coughs> and we don't care about the on change because it will be handled by the browser. And we do something only on submission. When the form is submitted or when some action is confirmed, in the form we must extract the data from the input elements by querying the DOM, basically. So we rely, for example, on the form mechanism that is able to collect the data of all the input elements that are contained with doing the section form slash form. So it's the normal browser mechanism that collects the data, and we can get this data and uh, process it in some way. So the difference is that the uncontrolled, how can we tell the two apart? A control component always has value and unchanged set. An uncontrolled component doesn't set either value nor unchanged. So it lets the form element free, and uh, normally it only cares about the value when the full form is submitted in some way. Okay, we are not going to, to work with this, uh, with this case. Um, I still have one, one, some minutes uh, to show an example. Uh, for example, I have a, let's put an input here, okay? Type uh, equal to text. At the end of the page. Let's see what happens. OK, I have an input text here. And this is free. This is uncontrolled. React doesn't know about it. It just renders the input element and the browser manages. I want to make it controlled. So maybe it's a comment field. And this means that they create a comment. You uh, state, you state, uh, OK, const. Comment, set comment, and you uh, state, uh, I create a state variable to control this element. Use state with uh, OK, for example. I set an initial value. So in this case, where's the browser? 
okay, nothing changed, so I only define the variable, the state variable. I can control the input element by setting the value to the comment state. So in this case, I created a read-only input field. If I try to type something or to delete something, it doesn't change. <coughs> I force the value. Okay? And then, if I want the user to be able to change this value, I need to also set the on change event to a callback that will take the event and set comment with the event.targeted value. So it takes what the user actually tried to type and uses it to update the state. And the state update, of course, will re-render the component by forcing the new value, which is exactly what the user wanted. And now I can type. But what I see is that the state here of the component is updated in real time according to what I'm typing there. And both ways, because if I change the state, uh, also the input is, uh, is updated. So actually, in this case, with this double control, I control the value, but I, but I manage the change. I'm creating, in the form, a window over the state variable that is updated in both ways. Uh, of course, uh, we can manage this uh, set comment uh, and check maybe if the user is typing some value which is invalid. Is try, we want to convert into uppercase, we want to reject, we have only numbers, etc. We can decide whether we want to accept the change. So we are not forced just to replicate whatever the user does, and we can also control, in this case, that's why there are control components. The modification depends on the, oh, my callback. And in my call, I can just copy the value or correct it in some way, <coughs> if I need, of course. OK, so uh, this is the basis for enabling the addition of new elements and the edit of an existing element, okay? which is the game that we are going to play next week. And today, the all. I, just, I will push immediately the code so that you can try it, okay?